Hi everyone and welcome to chapter 10. In chapter 10 we're going to look at cell reproduction and more specifically mitosis. So why do cells divide? It depends on the type of organism we're looking at. If we're looking at multicellular organisms, the reason cells may divide is to get bigger, growth, to maintain the number of cells because there are always cells um, dying, there's a turnover rate, and then we also need to repair cells and tissues. If you're looking at a single-celled organism, they use cell division in order to reproduce. Down here we have a picture of cell division in the sea urchin. So we see that we originally had one cell and it's dividing to become two cells. After a few rounds of cell division, we have a ball of cells. In this case, it looks like about 16. And then you ultimately get your final multicellular organism, like this sea urchin. So before we dive more deeply into cell reproduction, we have to talk about the genome, the DNA, because this structure has to be replicated before you can duplicate the cells. Going back, kind of reviewing prokaryotes, remember prokaryotes like bacteria, they have just one double-stranded circular DNA molecule. And since prokaryotes do not have a nucleus, this is found in the nucleoid region of the cell. So this is an example of a prokaryotic cell, and I see the nucleoid region is where the chromosomal DNA is located. In some prokaryotes, they also have smaller pieces of DNA known as plasmids. These are not critical for survival of the cell, but they usually have additional favorable characteristics that are expressed by these genes. And one example is antibiotic resistance. So if I have a bacterium, this oval shaped structure right here, they may have their normal circular genome, that's larger circle, and they might also have a second structure, the plasma DNA shown over here. What can happen is some bacteria that have these might have resistance to certain antibiotics like penicillin, penicillin resistance. And what's kind of scary is that if these bacteria, if that bacterium, meets another bacterium, what it has the ability to do is often replicate this plasmid and send it over to the second cell. Once that happens, now both of these bacterial cells are now resistant to the antibiotic. In contrast to prokaryotes, you remember that eukaryotes do have a nucleus and they usually have several double-stranded linear chromosomes. On the right, we have a picture of a plant cell and it looks like this is the structure of the cell wall. And I see a nucleus that looks like the envelope has broken down. And different phases of the cell cycle. So most of these are going through some phase of cell division. On the left here, we have a picture of chromosomes from a female, female somatic cell or female body cell. In humans, I know humans have 23 pairs of chromosome, so total of 20, uh, sorry, 46 total chromosomes, or 23 pairs. And I can see that this is female because she has two copies of the X chromosome. So that picture that I just showed you, and it's also shown here, is called a karyotype. Karyotype. And what's shown here are all the chromosomes usually obtained from a cell during a phase of mitosis called metaphase. These chromosomes are highlighted or colored using fluorescent labels, and then they're arranged in order. So the number of chromosomes in humans we said are 46, and this is not true for all organisms. Every, different, every species has a unique number of chromosomes. And the number of chromosomes does not necessarily tell you how intelligent the organism is. For example, humans have 46, but something like a potato, like potatoes have 48 chromosomes, and I don't think potatoes are smarter than humans. And then within a species like humans, the chromosome number is usually consistent, but might change with the type of cells that you have. For example, in humans, our body cells they're called somatic cells, have a different number of chromosomes than our germ cells, our gametes, which are the sperm and egg. And we're going to see this in the next slide. 
So somatic cells, again, are our body cells. So all the cells in your body, except for the sperm or egg, are somatic cells. And these are diploid cells because they have two versions of every gene. They have two sets of chromosomes. And the reason we have two sets, we have 23 pairs of chromosomes, is because each of us got 23 from mom and 23 from dad. And we, if we have a karyotype like the one shown here, this one's not colored, like the one we saw in the previous slides, but if we have a karyotype, each of these chromosomes came from a different parent. So let's pretend all of moms came from the left side or are posted on the left side and dads are on the right. So mom's chromosome one, dad's chromosome one makes up this individual. Then chromosome two from mom, chromosome two from dad, and so forth, all the way to the 23rd pair of chromosomes. But when humans are making gametes, these are sperm and egg, then these chromosomes will actually, or these cells, excuse me, will actually have half the number of chromosomes, and they're going to be haploid. We're going to learn more about this in a later chapter when we talk about meiosis, but it's good to know that gametes, these sperm and egg cells, are haploid. So I can see that that pair is missing. Now you only have one or the other instead of the pair. This is important because during reproduction and fertilization of the egg by the sperm, then the egg has 23 chromosomes, the sperm is going to have 23 chromosomes, and you're going to regenerate the normal number of chromosomes in the future baby. So that picture I showed you earlier, again, is called a karyotype, and it's also shown down here on the left. Both of these are karyotypes, and chromosomes in a karyotype are lined up based on their chromosome number which is based on the size of the chromosome. Chromosome one is the largest, the last pair over here, chromosome 22, are the smallest, and the 23rd pair are the sex chromosomes, XX or XY. Most of the chromosomes, chromosome, uh, the pairs one through 22, are homologous pairs of chromosomes. So let's pretend I have chromosome number one, this is one from mom, and then this is chromosome number one from dad, these are called homologous chromosomes because they encode different versions of the same genes. For example, let's pretend the gene for hair color is over here on this chromosome and mom has maybe blonde hair and the gene for hair color is also in the same region for the dad's chromosome, but maybe dad has brown hair. So these are called homologous chromosomes because they both have genes for hair color, but different versions of hair color. So you have the same trait, but different version of that trait. In chromosome number 23 though, that 23rd pair, those genomes don't match, and we call those heterologous pairs. For eukaryotes, our chromosomes are very big, and they have to somehow fit into the nucleus. So in order to do this, there is a lot of compaction going on. DNA has to be condensed and compacted to fit into the nucleus. So usually what we see is not just DNA smashed into the nucleus. Instead, it's organized by first wrapping around proteins called histone proteins. Every time you have DNA wrapped around histone proteins, it kind of looks like beads on a string. And each of these bead-like structures is called a nucleosome. These will further condense into chromatin. These are called chromatin fibers. And chromatin will wrap around itself to further condense. Ultimately, right before cell division occurs, they become the most dense that we'll ever see. And we can visualize them under the microscope. And they look like chromosomes. In this one, it's duplicated. One copy is on the left here, or I should say bottom. That's one copy. And its identical copy is attached on the other side. So sometimes you'll see a chromosome like that. That's one chromosome. After duplication, you'll see something like that. This is also one chromosome with an identical copy of itself attached at the center. 
Here's another look at the same thing, but you don't have to memorize all the different types of histone proteins. Just know that we have eight histone proteins and DNA is wrapped around those eight histone proteins to create this bead-like structure called a nucleosome. So I can see that we have many nucleosomes. They further condense into chromatin and heterochromatin, we're gonna talk more about later, is a type of very condensed chromatin that's not currently being read. The genes are not currently active. Eventually we see chromosomes, chromosomes that are very condensed. And again, as I mentioned, this is a duplicated copy. It looks like one chromosome on the left side and it's identical copy on the right side. This slide summarizes what I just mentioned in the previous slide, but we have DNA, pretend this is DNA, in red, and it's wrapped around the six histone proteins. Let's make the histone proteins blue. Let's pretend these are eight histone proteins here. Remember, each of these structures is called a nucleosome, and the DNA between these nucleosomes I'll use green, is called the linker DNA. So once this is more condensed, we call it chromatin, which is the main or usual state of DNA. It looks like spaghetti in water or a long hair in water. You only see chromosomes right before cell division. So you don't see those X-shaped structures until right before division. You usually see chromatin. So in chapter 10 in our book, it takes us to this YouTube video that shows chromosome packing inside the cell. And I recommend looking at it because especially over here, I took some screenshots of some phases of cell division. And you can see these are the chromosome structures that you see only during cell division, whereas the chromatin, so this is where we're looking at chromosomes, that X-shaped structure, and then, or it could be by itself if it's already divided. Most of the time you don't see that, you just see the not much, no shape, and that's chromatin. So when the cell is not actively dividing, it's in the chromatin form. All right, that takes us to the end of the first part of chapter 10. In the next video, we're gonna look at the cell cycle and mitosis.